Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Jeff Garland. I'm the author of Boost Date Time, in case you didn't know that. Um, I'll be presenting today with uh, Alistair and Beeman, and we're going to look at some little smaller gems that you're going to find in C11. Uh, some cool stuff that's in the standard library that wasn't quite big enough to do a presentation on its own. <coughs> now I have to say that after preparing this presentation, I'm not sure that's entirely true, um, because I actually have quite a lot of content here. Um, so what I'd like everybody to do, I'd ask you to sort of hold your questions a little bit. I'll try and pause and ask questions, at, or take questions at important points. But I don't want to get too bogged down, um, because we've got a 40 minute time limit for this presentation, and uh, I have, somewhere on the order of 30 slides, so um, that's going to be a chance. So, some alternate titles for this particular presentation uh, come down to how Boost Date Time inspired C++11 to be better. So I think I'm going to try and show you um, exactly uh, what Sean was talking about in the keynote, some beautiful C++11 code. I hope to inspire you today to see that came from the ideas in Boost Date and Time. It's not exactly the same, uh, but that's where a lot of it came from uh, with a lot of help from the committee and others. A second alternative title, because I just had to get this awesomeness thing in here again, <laughs> is that in fact, I believe C++11 is the awesomest language to write time threading code. I'm not going to go all the way for the threading thing yet, but I'll say at least the times part of it, uh, that's the truth. And I hope to uh, prove that point today. OK, so there's actually two parts of the talk. There's chrono and there's ratio. Ratio, um, we'll see when we get there, is part of making chrono happen, a really important part of it. But it's something you might be able to utilize yourself. So part one, chrono. Once upon a time, there was boost thread. And it needed time. And hence came x time. And the document said, X time. <coughs> well, you can read it. Define the time. Well, in fact, that isn't true. <laughs> it was never true. Um, but that's what they did. And, of course, it's a temporary solution that lived for years and years and years and almost became infinite. Okay? I can tell you it almost became infinite because I was there when they tried to make it infinite. <laughs> So it almost got in the standard as the way to specify time, thankfully not. So what is x time? Well, it's this thing. This is actually from the documentation. It says, oh, it's platform specific, and there's this thing, get time. OK. This is, this, is ugly. this is an ugly way to deal with time. First of all, you don't even know what the structure actually is. And even if you do know what the structure is, well, you'll see in a minute what the structure really was. And everybody knew what the structure was and used it. Uh, it's a very inconvenient way to deal with time. And further than that, it doesn't actually represent the real concepts that are in time uh, that need to be dealt with in any kind of first class way. So it's not x times fault. It's also c and POSIX. And this is the thing that gets me the most, is because the c and POSIX guys really should know better. Because really, you know, this is what you do to do nano sleep, right? I mean, isn't every bit in this thing precious? I guarantee you those are 32-bit types. I guarantee you when that nanosecond rolls over, there's wasted bits in there. So what the heck? And uh, anybody got any idea how long we're going to sleep here? Quick, calculate. <laughs> Figure it out. By the way, do you need to do math with this stuff at all? You ever tried to do math on this? It's ugly. This is the nicest looking sleep code I've ever seen in production, ever. Okay, most of it's 10 times uglier because you gotta do math. And that's, that's the hard thing. Even comparison is inefficient on a 64-bit machine because you're probably gonna have two 32-bit in there. So, ugly, ugly, ugly. This is definitely not awesome. We can definitely <laughs> do better. Okay, so. Another thing you'll see is there's going to be a lot of puns about time in this talk, so uh, it's time for a little time theory. <coughs> um, 
there's three really important things to know about time. Um, there's different ways of looking at, the, at it, but basically you can think of any time system that we use practically for managing time in these ways. There's an idea of a time scale with time points that represent some location in the time continuum. These usually have an epoch. The epoch is the anchor point for some kind of counted representation. Everybody has seen, you know, time t. This is exactly what time t is. Durations actually represent a length of time. They're not really attached to anything, but they're just a unit of how long is something. It's really handy for saying something like, oh, in 15 seconds I want to get this done. One of the interesting things about this is these timelines, they have some sort of resolution, some fundamental level that you can deal with. Is it one nanosecond, one millisecond, etc.? This is going to become important later. We'll see why the standard is the way it is, and it has to do with this. And then we have clocks, these ugly little hardware things that raise their head up and tell us, what time is it right now? Where are we on this time scale? They tell us that to a certain resolution, a certain error tolerance. And that is also an important thing. They have other properties that make things very, very complicated in the world. So unfortunately, clocks are sort of a bugaboo. But these are the three important concepts that you're going to see in the Kronos, uh, in the Chrono library. OK, so why did we do Chrono? We did Chrono because we needed to have tiny interfaces for threads. And we really wanted to have something that was nice and elegant. So here's an example. Uh, of time blocking, you'll see that there's basically two signatures. You've got a, a time point, an absolute time, and a duration with a relative time. So try lock for, try lock until. Very simple, very elegant. Same thing with condition variables. Um, you've got a wait until uh, with an absolute time, and you've got a wait for with a relative time. This allows you to do exactly what makes sense for your application. Is it wait for 10 seconds, or is it wait until a certain time? There's more. We can sleep now. We can say sleep for 10 seconds, or sleep until a certain time. <coughs> and then with future and shared future, you can do wait for, wait until, same exact way. Very nice symmetry to the way this works. So I tell lies. Many, many lies. <laughs> you should be prepared for this with me. Um, all of these signatures that you're seeing here are slightly simplified. Um, I've removed some detail for sake of understanding. Um, I will bring some of that detail back in the end, but only just briefly. If you open up your standard, the sacred text, and you look at it, you will see that it is much more complicated than this and I'll get into the reason why. OK, so here is some C++ 11 code. Can anybody in this room tell me what this does? I think so. So we think. Does so. anybody in the room not know what this does? <laughs> <laughs> OK. <coughs> For me, that is beautiful code. It is easy to read, easy to understand. And by the way, it crushes Java. That's how you would do something similar in Java. But really, or is this, this, how long is that? Really? 10 seconds. It's not the only way you can do it in Java 2, by the way. They have variations that look a lot like uh, that little time structure I showed you earlier, where you pass two numbers in. OK. So conclusion here, C++11 is awesome. Right? I mean, that's conclusion number one from the top. All right. So durations. Um, I've already shown you duration. These things right here, seconds and milliseconds, those are duration types. They're very cool. So simple thing. I want to construct a couple. By the way, there's more, many more types. I'll show you those later. And Maybe I want to do some math, OK? Right? I want to add stuff together, subtract it, do all the things that I would want to do with numbers. 
But look, this is kind of subtle here, right? D1, if you'll notice, is microseconds. And I'm adding seconds to it. Hmm. Nice. I can do all the usual comparison operations that you would think of doing on these types. And I can get the internal count. So you now know everything you need to know to use durations. Okay? I almost will guarantee you that they are unbreakable. Ooh, crap, I should probably do that, right? Somebody will find a way. But actually, I'll show you later. These things are almost unbreakable. Um, and it's actually a miracle of, you know, metaprogramming, et cetera, that they are so unbreakable and, and do exactly what you would expect when you expect them to. Okay, so here's the dry part. You know, here's what the interface looks like. It's an arithmetic value. I'll show you some of those later. You have all the expected comparisons. There's this thing count. Um, we'll get into rep type a little bit later. You can get out the count. We already saw that. Uh, there's some other traits, things like the minimum, the maximum, the zero value. Those are important in some programs. Um, it's a very simple thing. It's all got default construction, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, this is right out of the standard. So this is what, what it actually is. And then it has this other little clever business where it has a templated constructor. And lots of magic happens. <coughs> These templated constructor, constructors, there's actually another one. I'm not going to explain it all. The fact is, you don't need to know. You really don't. <coughs> Here's what you can do. So in comparison to boost date time, this is actually a lot more capable type. You can do a lot more things. OK, questions on duration, duration programming. Everybody's getting bored. We're not being awesome this is enough. OK. All right, so here's another piece of beautiful code. Any ideas what this does? Sleep for 20 milliseconds. Bingo. That took you all of about a second to figure out. Have you ever looked at this yeah, part of the library? No, but I, it could have executed 50 times while I was thinking about it. That is weird. You're not going to be like this for one millisecond. You're right. At but least. <laughs> that is the intent of the code. More on that later. OK. So again, all of this, break out your GCC, and it'll work. OK, you can do this. I verified it with GCC 4.6. So that's nice. So there's a couple new things in here. I got my duration type here, and I got this time point type here, and I got a <coughs> clock type. So I got a, a couple new things. So let's talk about clocks for a minute. Um, the clocks in the standard are a very simple idea. Basically, it's something that you can get a count from. Um, and they actually tie up a duration and a time point type. The duration type that's embedded in the time point is the thing that tells you what the resolution of that clock is, really. What its maximum resolution should be. And the time point is a way for you to get access to it. Again, these are very simple types. Um, and in comparison with boost state time, the time point type is a simplified thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the bottom line here is I want to get the value from the clock, right? I mean, I just want to know what the time is now. And then I want to do some operation like sleep, because that's what I want to do for Fred. OK. So it turns out that these time points, as I already illustrated, really play nice together with these duration types. So what am I doing here? I'm adding a time point to a duration, or duration to a time point, and I'm getting a time point out, because the time point is on this other side. And I've got a couple here chained together. And they're of different resolutions. And it all just works. So the fundamental thing to understand here is there's a logic to this. There's actually a theory behind it. Durations and durations can add together and make another duration. They're unattached to a number line. They just work. When you add a duration to a time point or subtract one, you get another one. If you subtract two time points, you get a duration. But why is the time point uh, specific to system clock, not just general time clock? 
Uh, it goes back to the fact that, well, hold that thought for a minute, okay? I think I'll answer that in a few slides. Okay, so time point minus the time point is the duration type. If you went back to that number line and you thought about it, it all makes sense. There's actually a mathematical description of it. It's called an affine space, I've been told. So. so what if I do this? I'm trying to assign it to milliseconds here instead of nanoseconds. Of course, I'm trying to assign it to the same type. But yeah. Never mind that. Same the same variable name. Um, yeah. But this actually will give you a compiler error about not enough resolution. And the reason for that actually is that this time point is of higher resolution than milliseconds. And there's a way I can get around this if I really want to, but that is the fact. But, but, but. In your example, um, that should that should give you 2040. Because if you set TP2, it, you can get an exact answer in this case. The type system doesn't know the values. Yeah, I know, but still. The type system, the type system understands that these time points are of a higher resolution than this duration. Right. And they know that you're going to lose information when you make this assignment. You have to make a specific cast. Excellent. Okay. And my point is, I understand what you're saying. I'm saying, given the code on your page, though, on the page up there, this particular code, that's not true. It is. <coughs> but for the numbers you're using. I'm telling you right now that, it, that this is the truth. The time point here has a resolution of nanoseconds, okay? So it is expecting to deal with nanoseconds. And when you subtract these two things and you try to assign it into a millisecond, it's not going to work because you will lose information to do that. You will lose a whole bunch of zeros. You will lose information, yes. Uh, Marshall, the, uh, the TP that uh, is in that first one yeah. will have some, non, some fractional amount of milliseconds in it. Absolutely. And TP2 will have the same fractional amount of milliseconds Oh, okay. Fair enough, fair enough, okay. <laughs> That's true. Now, in, in fact, wouldn't you get the exact same scenario if you had a couple of unsigned long longs, you're subtracting them, and then you use uniform initialization to construct an unsigned long with the braces. Don't they per prohibit mirroring conversion? So even if the actual values are totally safe. The compiler must give you an error. It's the exact same scenario here. I assure you that there is a lot of programming necessary to make sure that this gives you an error. And I assure you that your code will not operate the way you want it to if this does not give you an error. I'm not even arguing that. I'm just saying in this particular case with these particular numbers. That, you that's are, why you correct, correct sir. <laughs> you, can, you can get an exact answer. Not that the compiler will in fact compile. Not uh, but that's okay. We can move on. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> but I do conclude again <laughs> that this is the awesomest thing because it does what you want it to do. Can I don't I want to make this mistake by accident in my code. Or if I'm porting between systems, I want to find out that the system clock has changed its resolution. More on that in a minute. Okay, so what does the time point interface look like? Um, there's some basic stuff to construct it. If you default construct it, you'll get a clock, the uh, epoch of the clock that it belongs to. Um, you know, so if it's a time T based thing, it would be, you know, 1 1 You can call now on a clock. I already showed you that. That's about all you need to know to construct a time point. There's a couple of special conversion things you should be aware of. If you want to get a time T out of it, you can. Um, if you want to get the time since the epoch in, in a duration type, that's the duration type that comes along with it, um, you can get that information as well. That helps you actually make conversions to other things. There's all the arithmetic that I've already shown you, and so forth. So far, so good, right? Everything is beauty and light. Okay. You guys, how do you get the time zone? You get into that? What's that? Time zone. How do you get the No, no. No time zones here. This is only for threading. Only for threading. Okay, so, so what have we got here? We've got a problem, okay? Uh, those pesky little clocks that are a piece of hardware somewhere, they don't want to behave well. 
Um, they're different on every machine that we can think of. The machines are changing underneath us as we speak. As time rolls on, their capabilities are changing. Um, today, you know, a typical thing, you'll get a millisecond resolution out of a get time of day kind of call. So how in the heck can the C++ standard even be specified in some kind of reasonable way that allows you to do what you need to do? And by the way, you might be running on your version of some very custom hardware that's got some fancy clock in it that has really high resolution. You need really high resolution timing. We need the standard to be able to support you without making everyone else crazy. Now, I just showed you exactly the way it's going to work for everybody, whether you're one of these guys that's got a high performance clock or whether you've got just the regular clock. The problem is we have to have multiple clocks. Okay? So what we really want is code that's as portable as we can make it, that can take full advantage of the platform. We don't want least common denominator. Um, and code that doesn't have to change in the standard, that's what this is about, you know, as we get different ones, and as I already showed you, code that just plain works all the time as you expect it. So, of course, we only have one answer in C++, <laughs> and that's templates. Okay, so I told you I'd show you a real interface. This is what the real interface for TriLock for looks like, and try until, <coughs> try lock until. And you'll notice that there's this chrono duration, rep period, you know, time period, clock duration, all this complication. I showed you your, your user code earlier. You don't care, okay? You don't care, except for the fact that this complication gives you the ability to do wonderful things, okay? It allows us to add all those clocks, all that complication seamlessly and have the code look very much the same. So the standard chrono already gives you three different kinds of clocks. And I can tell you, I think there was a lot of discussion and debate, and this, this was very hard to do. It's very hard to do, and it's because the hardware is so hard and, and what you can expect is, is so hard. The basic clock I already showed you is a system clock. The problem with the system clock is if the user sets a time, NTP adjusts it, the clock can literally go backwards on you. It's not monotonic. It can be very problematic for making times and so forth. But you know what? Sometimes that's the only thing you really have. Sometimes that's the thing that makes sense to do. So it's a very basic thing. Really, it's probably just calling get time of day, which is the C API under the hood. There's another one called the steady clock. Okay, and this is meant to be monotonic. Okay, the clock cannot really be adjusted, and your values of time point always will go forward, right? You can never go backwards, no matter whether the user sets the you know clock that he looks at on his little screen or whatever. Okay, that's the idea of the steady clock. It'll be interesting to see how everybody implements that and whether they implement it well. You may find that there are some bad implementations of this. And then there's a high resolution clock, which is intended to mean, give me the highest performance clock I can get from this machine that has the smallest resolution to the finest level for timing that I can get. And what you're gonna probably find most of the time is that it's one of these others. Yes? So there's no guarantee on it increasing? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question, given that it does say, it, I'm surprised, you're right, it, it, it can be because it says it can be a synonym for system or steady, which, yeah, yeah. So beware, platforms will vary. Yes? There's a, uh, a static const bool in the clock that you can query to find out if it's steady or not. Yes. So you can find out that you can answer that question and compile it. Yes, you can. We did think of it. Um, from what I saw in the GCC 4.6 implementation, it looked to me like most of the time all three clocks were the same thing. I'm not sure that's correct technically because I don't think the steady clock, it's the get time of day clock. But so implementations will vary, beware, and look, look at your clock if your timing is really important to you. You know, the embedded guys, Scott, they know their clocks. They'll be able to figure this out. Okay. <laughs> Part two. We're going to go under the hood just a little bit. 
and talk about ratios. So if you open up the chrono header, you'll see something like this. Okay? So all those magic duration types that I was using earlier, I didn't use all of them, there's a few more in the standard actually, look something like this. So, okay, there's a couple of interesting things here. What's this thing nano up here? What's this ratio 3600 business? What's going on there? So, give you a little preview of ratio. It's a very simple idea. Um, basically, it's a way to do rational numbers at compile time. And basically, there's a whole set of math operations. You provide it basically two integer values, two values here for the ratio. And this is the magic behind all that compiler stuff that knows what to do with your types, how to up convert, down convert, etc. So here's actually what you'll see. Um, that nano thing is just a type def of a ratio from 1 to the 10 to the minus 9. You can't say it any other way. Um, so what this is trying to get, th this particular type def is, is generic, right? I mean, this is the ratio for nano in SI units, as are all the rest of these things. These are really SI unit ratios. But for the time part of it, what are we interested in? You know, we got one second. That's the fundamental measure of time that we're going to operate on in this particular world. And so if we do milliseconds, what do we have to do when we, when we do this? We have to divide by 1,000 if we've got one second. Or we have to multiply by 1,000 to get milliseconds. If you're going the other way, you divide by 1,000. So this ratio encapsulates that at compile time. Okay, and it's able to handle that at compile time. So all this magic I showed you is driven by ratio, ultimately. <coughs> so let's look at the other one. We have this 3600 business. So 3600 is just a short spelling for 3601. So this is another kind of ratio, right? Um, I've got 3600 seconds in and out. So it doesn't have to be a unit of tens. It can be a unit of anything. So it turns out this is really cool. Because what if I needed some kind of <coughs> time duration unit that the standard didn't think of or didn't want to bother having in because, you know, how the heck do they know what I'm doing in my satellite system? So let's just say that half a second is some really important thing. I've got an oscillator or whatever that operates at that frequency. How do I make this happen in duration? <coughs> Well, I've got a ratio, and that's all I have to do. I now have a type called half seconds. And the amazing thing is it works with the threading API and all the other duration types, the time point types, every other type I showed you. This code just now works. I can do everything with that half seconds type um, that I could do before. I can say half seconds from seconds. I can get its, its time. Oh. Oops. Here I went again and I made a compiler error. <coughs> well, why did I get a compiler error here? So in this case, I'm assigning from seconds into half seconds, higher resolution, right? In this case, I'm saying half seconds to seconds. I can't make that conversion, okay? And the compiler tells me this. This is a slightly simplified version of it but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So what can I do? This was alluded to earlier. If I really just want to force the compiler to stop paying, you know, don't worry about the fact that the resolution is different and it's going to be messed up. I can just do this thing called duration cast. This is also part of Chrome. Okay. And then I'll just get one because it's going to truncate. Make sense? So, I should have put at the end of here, awesome, because isn't it? I mean, that is the minimum amount of code possible to make something very complicated work in an amazing way. If you use this half seconds with sleep, time, weight, anything, it will all just work. Yes? So if you have seconds 
Does that mean the resolution is seconds? You can only go from one second to two seconds. You can't go 1.1 1 .1 or... That's exactly what it is. Yep, it. I got one second, then the next second, then the next second. The resolution is embedded in that type, and it understands that resolution and understands all the other types of resolutions because of that ratio and how they all relate at the one second level. So it can tell at compile time, by the way, you are going to be you know, dropping resolution by going into that second type. Yes. I think following on that, I might expect, you know, half seconds you had type depth with an N64 key. I, I might expect that to be tied somehow to seconds. So it's explicitly, this is tied to seconds. The N64 T makes no difference whatsoever. Okay, it really doesn't matter what the size of it is. Just think about it. You're going, you're doing something that's, you know, you've got time ticks like this. And then you've got the half units. So oh, yeah. when I say half units, I got three half seconds. How do I get that into seconds? You need to Oops, know that your base. I'm going to have to truncate, or I'm going to have to round, and that's what the compiler is telling you you're trying to do. I, I no, think I would just on this slide right here. You have to know that seconds is your basis because you just said half. That, that is true. Work. Yeah, that's. I would expect that to be tied to for, seconds. For the duration types in Chrono, the second is your your basics for all the types that go around it, hours, milliseconds, whichever direction you're going. Okay. And I think that I have the, so you'll note, I skipped over this, um, you know, here's your milliseconds, right? <coughs> one thousand. Uh, oh, I don't have hours on here, do I? Well, the hours, <laughs> it's the other direction, the one's on the other side. Well, actually, you can, you can think of it in terms of deca, though, right? So note the one is on the left here, and the 10 is over here. On deca, the one's on the other side. That's how you get the correct ratio. Yeah. I should add, too, that you can have duration double if you want, and you can put a floating point in there for the representation, which, which, which gives you the ability to have arbitrarily small tick intervals. I did skip over that fact that this turns out to work with floating point types too, and other numeric types if you want them to. Um, for time, I suggest to you it's highly unrecommended. <coughs> it is not recommended. Okay, um, but um, and part of the reason I say that is because um, you know I don't think you want floating point error, round off, and all the things associated with it. By the way, all the time APIs take counts, integers. By the way, all of the code that you're seeing is brutally efficient. Assignment, addition, this is all integer stuff at, at the low level, okay? This is more efficient than that X time thing those guys have. It really is. So the ranges of, say, the seconds duration is different from the range of, say, the nanoseconds duration. Correct. So the, um, the so-called widening conversion from seconds to nanoseconds may not necessarily be safe. It's not, yeah, exactly, but yeah, it's this thing here. I got a count of three in half seconds, and that's one and a half seconds. I'm gonna have to truncate, basically, or something. It's going yes. the way. So there is a concern about overflow here, and I think right. that's what you were alluding to. Yeah, and oh, okay. the, the general rule is, if you keep your duration within plus or minus about 293 years, you're not gonna overflow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I should say that with respect to Chrono, we actually took some great lengths, and I haven't really talked about it in this talk. Um, we took great lengths to specify the sizes, the minimum sizes required for the duration types and so forth, so that you could actually reason about the lengths of time. Uh, I think I showed you there's a couple of traits and other things on some of the types that allow you to get the min, max, and so forth. So, yes. I did want to correct my answer. If you try to create a custom duration, say uh, represent picoseconds with a 32 bit in, you'll get overflow. All right, a couple final thoughts. Of course, not all is sweetness in life. Um, there's at least one little thing you can't do, um, which is probably not too tragic. Um, you can't send a time point out to an O stream, which I know somebody's going to walk away and want to do. 30 seconds after the presentation. Um, so unfortunately, you can't do that because we don't have the screaming operator. Maybe we'll get that later. Um, in the meantime, you can do some conversions to boost big time, p time. You 
can find a way to do that. Here's a slide that shows you how to do it. I won't go through it. This question <laughs> hasn't come up yet, but I'm sure it will. Um, what about boost date time? Since a lot of the concepts you're seeing here came from boost date time, what should happen to boost date time now that we have chrono and now that we're moving forward? Well, there's a few obvious things. One is date time should just adopt the duration types because they're awesome. Um, and in fact, I think there's actually almost nothing that prevents them from working in earlier versions of C++. In fact, I think they do work in earlier versions. Um, we should adopt the time point abstractions kind of, sort of, almost. But it's the question you asked earlier that troubles me a bit about what we have with the time points and the clocks. I think we're probably going to need one that actually does stand alone from the clocks, um, ultimately. So you don't have to have um, you know, a time type that is totally married to a clock. And that's actually the way boost date time is today. <coughs> for the threading and the things that we did, uh, in C++11, it made sense to make the time point a slave to the clock so that you could get additional, more higher resolution time points, more sophisticated time points um, as necessary to operate with a custom clock. Because by the way, your vendor now can supply you with one of these little custom clock implementations and give you that high resolution clock. Um, we should probably adopt the clocks and integrate those clocks. I can't promise you when this is going to happen. I, wouldn't it make sense in date time just to have a POSIX clock and the key time is the POSIX clock time point? Uh, we have, even today in date time, we have multiple clocks just because of this resolution issue. Um, so I think probably now the easier thing to do is to just integrate with the clocks um, and so forth. So I actually don't think it's a big issue. We have the hooks as I kind of alluding to to actually make an independent type that can just do a very convert fast conversion and I think in most cases it'll be almost trivial to do so it will be speedy anyway. More to follow I'm sure. Okay. A few final thoughts. There's no more excuses, folks. When you're writing your timing code for threads, I want to be able to read it <laughs> in five seconds. I don't want to have to read this, you know, weird structure crap with weird math, okay? Show me some good code. Um, another point I'll make is study the standard library, folks. There's some really cool things in the standard library. This is a very small, very side part, if you will, of C++11. But there is some really clear, concise, cool code in here. I didn't even cover common type and a few other tricks that are really uh, in there. There's some really handy things. That's probably a good topic for another talk <coughs> here. Um, it's looking good. Uh, I did all the code you saw I compiled and ran with GCC 4.6. Uh, the clocks are meh, but I already told you to be worried about clocks. <coughs> Thanks to Howard. Sir, thank you. Um, he's the genius behind most of the very complicated template logic that make that the whole engine of the duration and so forth work. I wasn't smart enough to figure it out. He was. Uh, I guess it's on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, a, uh, a second shout out to Walter Brown, who yeah. invented ratio and SI units almost 10 years ago. Um, so that is old practice being standardized. And finally. There's no doubt in my mind. Show me another language where you can write what I just showed you on the screen. C++ 17. OK. He <laughs> said, show me. Just a quick question. Is there any time I should still stay with date time? Well, OK. So this library, if you're just doing threading and that kind of thing, no. Um, but if you're doing you know, more pedestrian time calendar applications. This does not have a date type. It doesn't have any of that other stuff in it. So, I mean, the question I rightly got asked, first thing when Alistair saw me was, okay, when's the rest of your proposal coming back? So, more to follow. Portland. Portland. <laughs> that may depend more on where my wife would like to go than anything else. <laughs> so. <laughs>
I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, you mentioned the, you know, stay away from the uh, floating point durations. Yeah. Uh, one time, one place that I use them regularly is if I'm just doing a, a quick and dirty timer, I just want to see how fast something took, I'll type def uh, duration at double to second. And uh, that, that defaults to, to seconds units, the, the ratio defaults to one. And then you can just subtract any two uh, durations you want and get it converted to seconds right away by putting it into that. Print it out and you've got your timer. Yes, uh, fantastic presentation, Strategy. Yeah. Uh, not really, you got all that into 40 minutes and kept it tight. Thank you very much. Our next up, which is a look at some of the things we have been allocated for C++11. So, trip in the background, who am I? I always like to start with one of these slides, but this time I'm not going to harp on about having the library working group chair, because uh, when it comes specifically to allocators, I now develop software with Bloomberg, and Bloomberg were the people who were particularly excited and motivated for allocators, so I, to an extent this is me representing our company's interests. Although, all this work in allocators actually happened before I joined, so I'm, I've been playing catch up a little bit over the last couple of years to get up with why we've done all this, but I think it's been a, a fabulous piece of work. So, some motivating, motivating examples why we might want to really use allocator support in C++. Uh, the standard allocator we get is effectively new delete from just global memory on the heap. And sometimes we want to do things a bit more efficiently, especially if you're in highly concurrent threaded code where this is pool allocators, each thread can have its own pool, so there's no thread contention going to grab memory. Uh, the ultimate thread pool, let's just allocate directly off my stack. So a quick array of say 2,000 chars, that's a very small memory pool, it's very thread safe for me to use locally within my function. Um, another use, big use we make of allocators, uh, diagnostic our, our test drivers, we will make, validate that the right memory is being allocated, deleted, nothing's leaking, the allocations are occurring where we expect, and this, this is a very nice facility. And another use I often hear people requesting are uh, shared memory, shared memory between processes, shared memory, memory mapped allocators. So these are things we would like to be doing, and in principle, it sounds like we can do these things in C++03. But there's a couple of problems. Um, and one of the other problems we're facing with this is that the allocators in the C++ container library, they're part of the type. So if I've got a vector dealing with one allocator and a vector dealing with another allocator, that's fundamentally built into the type. So I, I have to have two different overloads. And at this point in the standards process, it was sadly too late to fix that. That was something that Bloomberg particularly uh, concerned about. We have our workaround, but it involves an, another issue, which is allocators need, some of these allocators need state. So the notion we use, we like to have a, a virtual it, function interface to describe allocation. We can wrap that into an allocator, and that will go through and be a single type. That's our direction coming into this. You're not going to hear much more about the Bloomberg allocators at this point, but that was our motivation to solve these problems. And the reason we have these problems, we snuck into the C++ 98 standard. All these things have allocators. Allocators are objects. Objects can have state. But the library can make a couple of assumptions. All instances of an allocator will compare equal. So if you have state, we're going to ignore it anyway. And likewise, the memory that you return when you do an allocation, it's going to have to be the built-in native pointer type. If you're trying to use shared memory and return pointers into shared memory, you're using some kind of smart pointer, we're doing an offset. And that's not going to work with a C++03 standard library. Or it might. You might have a vendor who's paid a special attention to say, I'm not going to rely on these weasel words. But you can't do this portably. So for C++11, we really wanted to get rid of this language. If I read here, please, you're going to be looking over there. So. Translation of the first weasel word sentence basically says allocators can't have state because your implementation is completely at liberty to ignore it. And I said the weasel words, you have to have native pointers, so no shared memory allocators. So C11, we remove these weasel words, and we have to go somewhere to try to make this allocator therefore model easier for the vendors to use. And we came up with a new facility 
called allocator traits that describes a lot of the properties of allocators. And it also makes allocators easier to write because the allocator traits can supply an awful lot of defaults and default behavior for you. But it means that as an implementer, you have to use your allocators in a slightly different way. In C++03 and C++98, you have an allocator object in your container. You want to ask, request some memory. You go to the allocator and say, allocator, give me some memory. In C++11, you now want to acquire everything through this traits class. So you will go to the allocator traits class and say, allocator traits, here's an allocator. Use that to fetch me some memory. And that can then play all the games that get played at various places to make sure you get back the right information without having to do all the work in each container that the allocator traits can now default for us. So let, let's take a look at some of the contents of allocator traits. Essentially, we've got a bunch of type defs here. And each of these type defs, when you see an italicized C below, this is directly copy pasted from the standard. There's going to be some clever metaprogramming going on there to say, if your allocator has that type, great. I can simply put it in here. If you don't have that type, I'm going to try and do some clever things to guess what your appropriate type def that the clients of the allocator are going to need to, to, need to use. We can guess what that type def is going to be. You'll notice at the top here, uh, the value type, this is the one that we can't guess. Therefore, your allocator has to supply a value type nested type def. And with just that, we can basically guess the rest are going to be, you're going to have native pointers. You can rebind from this kind of pointer to that kind of pointer. We know what a void pointer is going to look like. Difference type, size type, these all come from basic pointers. Um, if you give us some kind of smart pointer, there's a pointer traits class also in the standard library, which we can then deduce an awful lot of these things, even if you supply only a couple. And so there's an awful lot of machinery behind this that makes the life of a container writer much simpler than when they want to support smart pointers, essentially. And likewise, um, we're using the new C++11 alias template facility, so that if I want to, I've got an allocator that allocates ints and an allocator that allocates doubles, I need to, to rebind the allocator to say, I want the same kind of allocator, but allocating this different thing, and I can get that alias back. Uh, in C++03, standard allocator had a, a little embedded template meta function that did that. Um, it's a C below. We're going to see if you have that kind of meta function in your allocator, We'll use it. Otherwise, we can pretty much invent the logic to make that work anyway with clever metaprogramming tricks, which I'm not going to show. So the allocator traits is always going to supply for you a lot of all the machinery and the hard work. Uh, likewise, we figured if you're using allocator traits quite frequently, you might want to have a, an easy way to rebind for the allocator traits for the same allocator on that other kind of thing you're using. So this, the, the rebind traits, it sounds Maybe not as useful as the rebind allocator, but as the container implementer, you're going to find you're actually using the rebind traits a lot more because it's the rebind traits that you go to to request all your functionality. Final part of the allocator traits, or almost final part of the allocator traits, these are the functions that you will go to to actually perform the allocation. So you'll notice that all static member functions, the allocator traits, it's a stateless class. It's a bundled set of utilities templated on the kind of allocator that you're using. So each method, the first thing you'll do is you'll pass it an allocator, and then the appropriate arguments for your request, and these essentially then get forwarded to the allocator to perform the functionality. But sometimes um, you do not need to provide all of the equivalent functionality and methods again in your allocator. Some of these, the basic behavior for how to Constructive value to pointer can be uh, assumed. We, we have knowledge that in a typical case, all you're going to do is an in place new. But if you wish to customize that, so you're trying to track when objects are allocated and deallocated, you're storing some extra state away through the allocator, going through this construct call gives the allocator the chance to do that additional state work that it wants. So again, this is why you always go through the, the allocator traits to get this behavior and we can default it or pass to the allocator accordingly. So, I'm slightly off the screen here. How do I adjust this? Digital zoom. Digital zoom So yeah, I'm afraid this is fairly small print. I really would like to get 
who sold one to the screen. Okay, one more. Here you go. So what you're looking at here, I might switch it across to be um, plus top line as well behind that. Uh, no, wait. We'll try. Then we'll go this way. What you're looking at here is a classic C++03 allocator. I slightly switch the syntax across to C++11 style because I like C++11 syntax, but essentially it's a copy paste from the standard with that minor reformat. <coughs> this is what you used to have to write in C++03. If we go to, I'm trying to write a new allocator in C++11, everything that's just gone grayed out can be deduced for me. And the little bits in yellow, the allocator system doesn't actually need. <coughs> So that was a bonus facility that was in standard allocator that the containers and so forth didn't actually need to use. So as you can see, all the type types at the top, we provide value type, all the rest are going to be deduced. Uh, this little meta function to do the rebind we're getting from the allocator trait, and if we don't supply it, we'll say, but the thing you pass me, if it's a template, I can deduce it as a template and therefore do the rebind for you and still give you the right kind of having rebound that template quite generically. Um, we're still going to have to provide constructors and destructors because it's our object, we know the state we're manipulating. Can't get out of that one. Um, the, the basic allocate and deallocate call. This is your functionality. If you don't provide this, you really aren't doing anything. Uh, but the, these other methods, again, construct and destroy, these are nice places for you to intercept the protocol so I can do any additional bookkeeping. But if you don't do that, we can deduce the behavior of simply do an in-place allocation and an in-place destroy. Likewise, max size, if you don't give it to us, we'll just go to numeric limits and say it's whatever the maximum value for the, for the numeric type you gave us for the point of difference type and all those other things that, again, we might have been used further on that. Allocators have to be equality comparable. There's two allocators compare equal if they can allocate and deallocate the same memory. So if you've got a stateless allocator, like standard allocator, these just return true or false accordingly all the time. But if you're dealing with stateful allocators, you might need to do a little bit of work there. Either way, the compiler can't deduce these for you. Use these you again have to supply. But we've taken away probably over half the class here. It makes generally writing a new allocator much simpler. Stefan? Uh, must you provide not equal, or can allocator traits generate that given only equal equal? Allocator traits doesn't try to supply free functions. OK. Uh, I'm not sure if not equals is strictly necessary, but I think the allocator requirements, if you go to the requirements table in the standard, will require both of them. Okay. And, but yes, one must be the negation of the other. So one might be tricky to supply, the other one's still trivial to just call the other one and negate it. Last facility that has come with the new ability to have stateful allocators is something we call allocator propagation. There's three traits that we find in the um, allocator traits uh, template again. There's a C below option which says here's our rules to deduce what the value of these traits should be. And these are standard predicate type traits. They're going to derive from integral constant true or integ integral constant false to say whether or not they have this trait. But of course what you want to know is what do the traits do? The question is, if I'm copying a container, which allocator should I use? Or I'm constructing a container. Which allocator should I use? Because I, I, I've got one at both source and destination. And for a copy construction, it's not too difficult because we either use the default allocator if you don't give us one when you make the copy, or we can use the, you can specifically give us an allocator. We have an extended copy constructor, which takes a copy and an allocator. So you can then just pull that out of the source one at your choice. If it's an assignment operator, uh, there's no way to tell that specific operation which allocator you want to use. So there's a question. Do I use the allocator that the object I'm assigning to already has, knowing how to manage its memory, or is this a property I should be copying from the source object that I'm saying, I've got this container, I've got an allocator and all my state together. Here, take all that state. <coughs> now, our experience at Bloomberg was that, in general, you wanted to say, once I've got a container, the container says, this is the allocator I'm using to control my memory management facility. It's a property of this object. Whereas the values I'm copying across, that's the state I'm trying to manage. So in general, we believe allocators shouldn't propagate. But there are other models, which is why we have those propagation traits that allow us to say, this kind of allocator, either when I copy the container, I copy the allocator with it, 
or I swap, if I swap containers, the allocators can swap. Or if, if just doing a move assignment, maybe on the move case, I want to move the allocator to say, you're taking ownership, but maybe not on the go. Stefan. Have you ever seen a case where you don't want the three propagate traits to all be true or all be false? Are there times when you want to mix and match? I suspect on the assignments, the assignments will be consistent, but I can imagine cases where maybe swapping I might want to be a bit funny because swaps are a fairly fundamental kind of way of exchanging state. Whereas but in general, I've seen yet generally they're either all true or all false. Okay, because I look at that and it makes me sort of wish there was just one propagate trait rather than three. We, we tried to keep this as small and compact as an extension as we could. That different people look at this, they think they see different needs. And this is a, this is a new model. Again, with these propagation traits, this isn't the Bloomberg allocator model we use internally. This is the machinery to put into the C++ standard that allows a variety of models to be supported, including our own. So this is actually far more general than we needed, but we wanted to make sure we addressed everyone's needs. And hence, this was a bit more fine-grained than we might have thought about, because when it was going through the review process, certainly some people wanted to split this out. Howard? I feel like I can address that a little bit further. Uh, both swap and move assignment typically transfer resources, and so it's not unreasonable to think that allocator state may want to stay with the resource. Whereas with uh, copy assignment, Resources are not usually changed, and so you usually don't want to uh, transfer allocator state. That's just another way of looking at, at allocators. Not everybody wants to do that, though. So if I use in place mm -hmm. um, in a collection, uh, do I get the allocator populated in my type regardless of these traits? question. So and place is going to call the constructor of the object you're in placing and it's going to pass to the arguments the list of arguments that you pass to the in place. There are rules to say if the type I'm using has additional constructors that take an allocator RT type, which we then have a simple value that we can we can drop in. It says, aha, I recognize that this type is trying to use the same kind of allocator we will detect that and call that. And if you don't supply that, it will use it. To, it will use it will use whatever allocator you get the default construct from passing that the constructors for that type without giving it an allocator. It will get the default allocator of if I've got the string and I'm not declared. Right. Yeah. Do, still, if he does a new inside of the constructor, he's just going to get the regular name. But with the app, but with string in particular, that has these extra allocators, so it should be using the same kind of allocator as comes from the container. Okay. Is that true of, uh, well, I guess it would, by virtue of the fact that all the questions have this, is it something all the questions in the screen? You remind me, I really could have put a slide in about that, and I didn't, so thanks for calling it out. Uh, I've got a, a slightly related slide that's about two slides further on. I'm going to come back to a more general discussion now. I'm getting close to the end, so I think I'm inclined to finish the presentation and then field any questions. Ah, in fact, the next slide's going there. Scope allocator adapter is addressing the same kind of thing. So in this case, I've got a vector of strings, and I'm using a memory mapped allocator to own the memory that's packing the, uh, the vector. And of course, a memory mapped allocator doesn't has to use a, sm a smart pointer to be some kind of offset pointer to say, here's the start of the memory region, and I'm an offset into that pointer. If I'm storing data in there, that data also better be using offset pointers rather than native pointers to describe the data, because otherwise those pointers aren't going to be referenced in, in another process. So the strings internally really need to be using the same kind of smart pointer. And in this case, we do the adaption using the scope allocator adapter. It's a mechanism that will propagate the same kind of allocator as I built this container. I probably should have put an example using the syntax for the scope allocator adapter type. It's a template in the standard library that solves this problem, um, yeah, I forgot to put the, act the actual example of using it in the slide. It seems to me that this is going to interact really poorly with move semantics just in general. It, that there are going to be lots of cases where you say move and it says no, I just need to copy. Well, if you go to move and basically the two allocators compare equal, perfect, you right. can move. No problem. And typical return value from a function. This is a, you know, mm -hmm. move constructors, these all work just fine. But different allocators. 
uh, some allocators, like standard allocator, it's stateless. Mm -hmm. All allocators will compare equal. And if you're in a place where allocators are stable, you're going to be a little bit more careful. You'll have hopefully context to resolve and manage those issues. Uh, again, it's something that we don't have much experience with this new model yet. It's coming. Uh, I'm not aware of many implementations of this. GCC have just started. Uh, how it, I believe LibC++ has had this for a little while now. Yes. And Stefan's probably going to tell me that Microsoft is shipping it in the next version. Yeah, it's in VC11. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that uh, it makes implementers' lives uh, miserable. <laughs> but uh, if you're not doing tricky things with allocators, it doesn't affect move assignment. Uh, it's only if you've got a very, you know, stable allocator that has not equal returning true sometimes that well, you're going to get. I was just thinking about this. You have a vector, a vector of strings in shared memory, and you have a vector, or you have a string on the stack, and you say, "Stare to move into this vector." Well, obviously, you can't just move. Okay. But I think I think if you want to use actually the, the, the scoped allocator, you actually have to give string a memmap alloc first. So the string you have in the stack will be a different type than the string in the container. Which is what you want? Yeah. So there's no moving anyway. Okay. So it's not always vector string, it's vector basic string, char, char, base. Yeah. Uh, transmission line rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan brought up the point that this is a uh, change is like a little for the implementers of these containers. I like how you said a little. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm putting a, a very hasty, very cut down implementation of an example, something like a dynamic array. So it, it's like a vector that you can't resize is the notion of this type I'm building. So I've got type name T for the element type time storing. I take allocator, whatever allocator type you give me. Uh, I've got a constructor, so I can construct from an initializer list of values, and that, that will be my <laughs> only constructor. So my implementation details. It becomes incredibly useful. So the first thing you do is you make a type debt, a type alias for your allocator traits, because you'll be using these a lot if you've got more than one method here. Uh, and likewise, the pointer type wants to be, if the allocator returns a funky pointer type, I'm no longer going to just always assume it's T star. So the root of the, my dynamically allocated array is going to be type pointer. So now I've got two data members, pointer to part of the dynamic array, and an allocator. How does that look in implementation of the constructor? Again, just implementing one method rather than the whole suite of things that makes Stefan's life a bit more miserable, it seems. Uh, we'll uh, do the initial, initial, initialize the list, we'll initialize both data members, or default construct the uh, pointer in, in case it's got any default behavior. Then I want to allocate some memory, so I go to the allocator traits, which you'll see alloc traits has occurred at least four times in there. I don't want to be Writing out this big template definition of what this thing is each time. The alias is really handy. Uh, and I've got allocate. I pass in my allocator and say, this is the number of elements I need, which is the length of the initializer list. Um, next thing I do is I'm taking a native pointer by dereferencing that, iter that uh, pointer. The construct call we're about to call requires a native pointer, not the smart pointer that might have come back from the allocator. Likewise, I'm using the standard address of call to obtain that address, just in case someone's given me a sneaky type at the other end that has overloaded the operator, unary operator address of. Stefan? The worst part is you have to say std address of so you don't get ADL. It's already unbroken, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've now got, I've done my allocation, I've got the address of my memory, I'm going to start copying elements across from the from the initializer list. Of course, I want to write nice, clean, exception safe code, so I have a try and catch to clean this all up. I'm not trying to create any clever smart pointers locally for this, because I want the example to be showing you the text of what we have. There are some other, other techniques we might use here. So I'm using a new style for loop to walk over the initializer list, and I'm going to construct each element in turn, and after I've constructed it, I will then increment to be looking at the next element in, in the array I'm constructing. One of, the, one of these copy constructors here throws. Oops, I'm going to my catch. I need to clean up all my objects, deallocate my memory, and rethrow. So again, you can see the allocator traits. All the methods are saying, pass the allocator to the allocator traits, pass the other arguments as necessary, and we're done. I think that's my last slide, but 
if I, was, if I was doing this for real, no, I probably wouldn't do this. What I would do is this kind of logic to do the cleanup would be in the descriptor for the class. I would have a default constructor that doesn't do any allocation. And then when I, um, I would delegate to the default constructor so that I've got a completely constructed object, I'm guaranteed that if anything in this part of the constructor throws, I'm going to destroy the object. And my destructor already has the right logic. You know what this reminds me of? Uninitialized happy. I was thinking about that as well, but I didn't want to start writing all the adapters or the oh, lambda to try to do the no, no, interface. No, I wanted the to keep the syntax as simple as possible. Yeah. Yes. Stefan. Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, I think the destruction order would have to be reversed of construction. Um, uh, actually, the standard, I believe, says it's forward, and it is not like array. That's weird. It's kind of unusual. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the other thing was you just mentioned um, you just mentioned you would delegate to the default constructor. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing to do with this talk, but I'm, uh, if you delegate to the constructor and that constructor finishes, your object is con considered constructed. Yes. So when I come back into the main function body of the constructor that did the delegation, I'm guaranteed my object constructor is going to run. Okay. That's cool. Now I really want delegating constructors. <laughs> <laughs> that is the coolest part about delegating constructors. They're great. I, I tried. Herb seemed to want to go the other way. I tried hard explaining it to him and couldn't get the point across. Two minutes with Howard, everyone sold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's interesting because you, you can throw in an exception from your constructor and still have your constructor get right. As long as you delegate it to another constructor that has successfully completed. Yes. You can even chain these delegating constructors if you're mad. But. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe this is a crazy idea. Why isn't why isn't the allocator trace object list? Because the allocator trace and the allocator main value cares what that pointer really is. Uh, I I can't remember the design decision on that, but standard address of this facility will give you address of any. Thing that you pass it by reference, so do you why would you replicate that functionality in the sense of do you really need a real address when the only guy who's using it is the guy in yellow? The only guy that's using the blue is the guy in yellow, so what did why does it have to be a real address? Because you could have implemented construct in your own house. The question is, why, why does the protocol require you pass a I native pointer there rather than a... I don't know. But to me, it's part of our, if we're going to yeah. use and apply the method for you, we're going to... There was a reason that I cannot recall it, which is not a very satisfactory answer, I'm afraid. <coughs> I think we should probably take one more so we have time for being a... Marshall? Um, you got two uses of auto there. Yes. Um, is there ever a case where you're not going to be T? No, I just like auto. Okay, I just, you know, I'm looking at that, I'm looking at, I think, auto, auto, auto. What could that be besides T? In these cases, it's a particularly long spelling of T, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Because what I'm doing, going to do, is I'm not going to try to teach you something in the sense the other presenters I'm going to try to motivate you to understand there's a component in C++11 standard library that provides, it's a, a minor component, but it provides some interesting capabilities, and I'm just going to try to educate you that, you're, that they're there. It's pretty simple, so you can learn to use it yourself. You can look up a standard, and there's boost system which is the exact same thing. And this is the, this is the <coughs> system error support. And uh, what we're talking about here is error codes, something really basic. Um, in our modern C++ world, we don't run into them too often. However, there are situations where they are still of some interest. And that primarily occurs when you are dealing with 
other APIs, not C++ kind of stuff. Let's say that the implementation of some library, the way it really works is it calls down to the operating system. So if you look at whose file system or you look at some aspects of threading, regardless of how it's implemented, or any other any other library that's, that's um, of course, all I.O. stuff. Inside, it's dealing with, it's got to deal with error codes. And so, there are, we don't, we, we don't want to forget error codes completely. If you go to the extreme of trying to, they're sort of nasty things in some ways, but very low level, but we can generalize the concept of an error code and produce some, some ways of dealing with it in a C++ sort of way that's, that's uh, considerably better than anything that we had in the past. We just need really whack me. Excuse me. sort of a C++ view of uh, uh, a very sort of boost, the kind of code I write boost view and a standard library view too of the problem we're dealing with. Uh, when a low level function reports an error code, reports an error via <coughs> an error code, we often want to capture that code. And the, the, uh, one of the places where you can see the, the, the cost of the failure to do that in C++ is situations where uh, the original library designs for, for instance, I.O. just threw exceptions, and it's just said an, an exception, you know, an error has occurred. Well, that's not good enough when you're dealing with I.O. very often. You want to know exactly what the error is, and that's represented in the error code, because According to the exact cause, specific cause of the error, you can take different courses of action. The way you recover from a file not found is very, very much different from uh, a not ready error versus a permissions error or the whole file system died on you error. Um, another characteristic of error codes in C++ programs may want to respond to them in a very system-specific way. So you want, if you're running on Windows, you want to know what, what Windows thinks the error code is. You don't want to posit the error code. You want something very specific to Windows. That's one app, app one part of an app. Another situation arises, though, in a lot of our code, uh, where R is boost, or a lot of the code I've commercially is that it has to be portable, and so you want to be able to write a portable piece of code that copes with the, the general concept, say, of file not found, rather than a specific Windows code. So you, you know, you'd like to be able to write portable code and yet cope with these very low-level system-specific error codes. <coughs> a third problem, or another problem, is that there are a lot of kinds of error codes out there. I mean, there's the, the ones that, that uh, there are a few, I guess, from them correctly, the C++ standard, the POSIX code, that, the, the ARC, the, the, those, uh, the AirNo error codes. There's one set, but there's a million other kinds, you know, this, this thing produces, you know, Milo level app has error codes one, two, and three, and they have some, meaning specific to that system. And, uh, 
I, it would be nice to have some an abstraction essentially that allows you to deal with um, with the error codes that are already out there. And then lastly, geez, uh, you're still, some people are still writing software in C++ where you have some very low level error reporting to do and an error code is appropriate and uh, a lot of the networking code. Um, there's a lot of stuff where you returning an error code still makes some sense. So what, what's the C++, what is boost.system and the C++ standard library done to, to, what's the solution to these problems? Okay, there is a component now in the C++ standard library. Uh, it's 19.5 uh, system error support. Um, and it's part of C++ 11. Take a look at it in your standard, or if you happen to be very boost friendly, since a lot, which I assume a lot of you are, uh, go to the boost system documentation. I, if there's any differences between what's in the standard and what's in boost system, believe the standard, the boost system is, tracks the standard and as we made up some changes in response feedback from the committee team. They should be pretty much the same thing. Uh, I keep wanting to run some, run my test cases of, uh, against what vendors are actually shipping and I, 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 I just, I just, I'm not ready to cope with that. I, I'm just hoping they did a good job. It's simple enough, I'm sure. We haven't done a lot of conversions. Someday I'll do that. Uh, so, so there's a, got system and, and, uh, the, and the system error code support for the same thing. Um, and I'm just going to describe what what you should be some of the key things that you can look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. would, it, would it be fair to say that um, one of the things that's happened uh, in some of the newer additions to the standard library is that we're starting to deal with the cases where we have to effectively um, deal with the operating system APIs in a better way than the trouble was needed in, in prior versions. And that this, the facility that you're talking about really has to be there because otherwise we don't have a common way to transmit that. Right, and that's why it's in C11 rather than uh, waiting until something like, say, the file system. The file system hits, you've got it in spades, because you cannot, there, there are many, many situations when you're manipulating file systems that just, errors are not exceptional. And so, really, what's happened already right in Boost is file system, Azure, and probably some others are all new. Yes, and in fact, and there are some uses in this, there are already some uses in the standard library, yeah, we're gonna talk about uh, the, the Chapter 27, um, I.O., there's a, uh, a little specific um, set of error codes that are now with different exceptions being thrown in. It includes the error code. And you get into that, okay, there's, there's a, an exception now, system error. You know, a type that's used is to create an exception to throw that. And it's, it's a derived from runtime error. It uh, is, so it's, pretty much identical to runtime era, except that the state of run, in, uh, it has an, an additional state inside it. Runtime era has the state that your observer is what, and uh, this new system era has an additional state that is a thing called an error code, which is a packaging, is a generalization of an error code, and you, there is a, a uh, observer to retain that. So when you catch one of these errors, you, you can deal with it and just say, uh, in the file system, this happens all the time that in a lot of other applications, you get some apps where all you care about is there's an error and you're basically gonna die probably, just report it and die, and so you just catch it and 
access to what, just as in any runtime error. But when you care, then that specific error code is there, and you can take different actions to resolve it. Um, so that's sort of a poster child. Now, what is one of these error codes? Uh, it's basically got, as far as the model, uh, looking around, error codes, they always seem to be numeric values. In. That, and you just if we were going to try to, I was going to try to have an abstraction over that, but it's not, they're always in, so it's just an end. Okay, but it's got one other thing in this little struct package error code. Uh, and that is, it's got something called an error category. Because knowing an int for a value of five or something doesn't, isn't quite enough. You need to know what kind of an error code is this? Is it a POSIX code or is it a, you know, a um, uh, Microsoft Windows has a, I forget, what's the name of the header, error? error? Eight results or? Yeah, yeah. get last error function. Oh, yeah. yeah, get last error function returns. And it's the same deal, it's an integer value, but it, what are the meanings of those? Okay, you need to know what kind of an error this is. So that's the other thing, error category is an identification essentially of what kind of an error it is. Now, that's, and, and so you deal with it at that point, and, and there are some other functions and ways to get a, a, you know, a description out of it and that sort of thing. And that's great if the way you choose to cope with this error is you want to know the specific code that came out of Windows or the Mac or your specific operating system, you deal with it at that level. So error code is, is something that's very specific. There's something else that's called an error condition, and the two are very, very, very similar, but an error condition is portable. It's, it's, it's essentially you take the system-specific error code you convert it to an error condition, which we chose the POSIX codes, because that means at least a large percentage of the people have at least, you know, programmers have at least some familiarity with those codes. C, C standard uses some of them, a few of them. But, um, so the, so you can, and there's a the conversion mechanism to this. So whenever you've got one of these specific error codes, you can find out the error condition that it represents. So you can, you can write portable code that uh, works on Windows. You write it on Windows, but then when it goes over and runs on Linux or something, it'll still, it still not only compiles correctly, but the semantic meaning is the same. So that's the distinction between an error code and an error condition. Um, and that's, that's all really the, all that's in there. And, and there isn't any need, and we're out of time anyway, to go into it in any kind of detail. You guys can figure it out. You're plenty smart. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a wondrous thing. It's just a basic little gem that's there that can help you. And so the the error domain error category, whatever. That's that's the runtime value, not the type. <coughs> right. It, there's that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's what it is a pointer, I think, underneath. It's it's, it's okay, the, 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 the actual like specs or right. something that um, it would be a virtual, except that we really want this incredibly lightweight. But I was thinking more of it of it being a, a error code. Windows error is a different type than a, than a POSIX error. Like if I want to look at, they, they both derive from system error. No, that we tried that and did not do that. We, 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 we. Oh, I know the last thing, I, for, I forget the whole, the last motivation for this. <coughs> when you do your own, then the, the mechanisms are there for you're writing a new library and you've got a similar situation Here's how to enable all of this new machine. All of the machinery is there for you to enable your kind of error with your messages associated with numeric values in your own and, and
and so you can you you as a user the the C++ standard library is using this facility, but you as a user can also use this facility uh, if you are writing a library or <coughs> anything else where it would be appropriate to uh, either include an error code as part of an exception or some things you don't even want the overhead of going an exception, you may just return it by, you know, as a return. And that, that's all this, this uh, that's, it's, it's just a little gem. I think it's, I hope it, it helps people deal a little bit better with errors when simply throwing an exception isn't good enough. So is there a standard way of getting the error message from the error? Yes. Either a system specific message or a general message. <laughs> you didn't mention the idiom of passing a non-comps reference to an error code. I just, I didn't want to, I'm just, mainly I'm trying to let you guys know that it's there, and we have a couple more questions. And uh, error. Yeah. error codes have a default condition that allows you to convert the error code to the condition, and uh, I was just recently trying that with GCC, I think 4.6, and it, that doesn't work yet in some libraries, so going from the system specific error code to the default condition, doesn't yet work. Yeah, I really guess I do need to run my, uh, I had to run the boost test cases again. I had to put the yeah. boost one in yeah. instead, so. <coughs> to make sure that everybody's reading. I'm sure that'll get right. So I've got a question actually for Stefan. Uh, VC 2010, standard library has a system error, but it says. We did? I forget that. It has. <laughs> okay. But the system error code, together. They, they still use error node for the system error code. <laughs> and I was wondering. I'm not actually sure if we fixed that. Um, send me if there are any plans to use to use Windows error codes or even H results. There was a. Um, provide categories for those. There was a no. mapping of messages that you engaged. You, um, yeah, you and I had a little exchange about that, and you, because I had to laugh about the. I saw you sent me a copy of the internal Microsoft bug report, and it just in, in the had something equivalent proposed resolution and, and it just said do it the way Boost does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> there was an awareness on Microsoft's part that, that on, you know. Actually, I think I remember that and I think. Particularly uh, that there was some kind of a glitch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think the sub team <laughs> actually fixed that. It's so just yeah, great because I want to work on this for yeah. Windows uh, Great stuff.